And to deal with this topic is James Turner Johnson, distinguished professor of religion at Rutgers University. He's the author of several important books that bear on many of the issues we're discussing today, books on the just war tradition, on military force and ethics and the use of force, and on the issue of sovereignty. He has received uh, fellowships from the Rockefeller Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts. He's a, co he's a founding co-editor of the Journal of Military Ethics. He received his PhD from Princeton University. Please welcome Professor James Turner Johnson. Thank you, Ellen. It's, it was the NEH, not the NEA. I haven't broken into the arts field yet. Maybe on retirement, who knows. I'll take up painting, uh, like some other people I, th I can think of. Um, some of you may wonder what in the world a professor of religion is doing talking about nuclear strategy and uh, or even why such a person should be here this weekend. And the answer Ellen hinted at, uh, for the last 45 years or so, I have been working on Western moral doctrine on war. Uh, the, uh, in the West, this means the just war tradition, its historical development, and its contemporary application. And uh, since about 1990, I've been also working on the jihad tradition and the Islamic religious tradition. And, uh, and, and uh, as the just war tradition was recovered, in the United States and, and indeed in the West uh, in the early 1960s and, and after it was recovered by, uh, among others, uh, people from within the field of religion. And so it's, uh, it's been a central uh, focus for the debating about the use of armed force generally within the framework of American uh, religious thought and uh, it's, it, it's been spun out to uh, bear on all kinds of other issues as well. Um, from this uh, perspective, and also uh, emboldened by Lou Fisher's reminding us how he has uh, sought to correct the Supreme Court on a number of issues in, uh, in the past, with, we'll, we'll, we'll see about how, about how successful that is. Uh, I, uh, I want to uh, uh, correct Walter, Walter McDougall. The just war tradition is not, in fact, a Catholic tradition in the sense that most people would understand that. It came together in the Middle Ages, and most of the people who put it together were, in fact, uh, members of religious orders or priests or both. Uh, but that was because they happened to be the educated folks at the time. Uh, virtually nobody else could read or write. And, the, uh, and so uh, these people who were located in the early medieval universities uh, basically did everything in, in recovering the tradition that had been lost in what used to be called the Dark Ages and trying to figure out how to interpret it and how to, how to apply it uh, in the context of their, of their own times and their needs. So the, uh, the, the man that put together the uh, initial systematic statement of the idea of just war was a monk, a man named Gratian, who was a canon lawyer. Uh, but he worked in a community that had to do with the recovery of Roman law. All the uh, civilian, uh, civil lawyers were also monks. Uh, the doctors were monks. Uh, you know, so everybody, everybody who was uh, involved in any kind of intellectual activity in this period uh, was of the same character. The, um, the, the, the torch was later picked up by the theologians, Thomas Aquinas being the first important one of these. Uh, but again, this doesn't mean that this was a church doctrine. Uh, in fact, uh, if anything, it was, uh, it was, it's better understood as a cultural consensus that happened to be put together by the work of people who wore, uh, the, uh, who wore the gowns of religious orders or the mantle of a priest. At any rate, it's, it's certainly not a Catholic doctrine anymore, the U.S. Catholic bishops, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Uh, I, I came here from, the, uh, from Annapolis, the United States Naval Academy, where I was one of the keynoters at this year's McCain Conference, which 
for those of you that don't know, is a conference that's put on every year by the Stockdale Center, which is the ethics center for the U.S. Navy, Navy and Marine Corps. And uh, uh, the, uh, the subject of just war is really very central in uh, military education at the war college level, at the staff college level, at the academy level. It, uh, it really permeates this. There is a great deal of discussion about it all the time. And uh, what, uh, the way this discussion moves is, uh, is, is largely the way it moved in the Middle Ages. That is, it has to do with this as something having to do with broader cultural values and their, their uh, uh, being maintained. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful experience for me to come from that gathering of very smart people at the top of their game to this gathering of very smart people at the top of their game, and I'm th uh, very thankful to have been invited to be here. Um, I, I should also say that, uh, that I, I disagree with most of what uh, Walter laid out as his uh, FPRI colleagues' views on uh, the way military, uh, uh, the U.S. military handles the, uh, the ethical issues. Uh, Malam Waken, who was the man that really started the study of military ethics in the U.S. forces, uh, was the, the uh, chief, the, the head of the philosophy department at the Air Force Academy. Uh, when he did so, uh, he, uh, he later retired and moved on to become a brigadier general, but he was heavily involved in the formation of, the, of what was then called the Joint Professional Committee on uh, uh, the Joint Professional St Joint Service Committee on Professional Ethics, JSCOPE. I couldn't get the acronym right. Uh, and that's now the International Society of Military Ethics. The, the, my point is that the, the Air Force has been very heavily involved in this from the very beginning and still is. The, uh, the fact that, uh, that this conference that I just came from was at the Naval Academy is just uh, an illustration of how deeply the Navy is involved in this and how long they have been involved in it. Uh, sure, the, uh, the Army and the Marines are also involved. They have their own uh, educational uh, institutions that, that uh, deal with this and, and their, own, uh, uh, their own history, their own track record uh, with uh, several people here who have been involved in it uh, in uh, various stages of their career. And, uh, and so my, my, my real point is that this is something that has, for a long time now, extended way across all the frame of uh, spectrum of American military services, and it's taken very seriously there, where it's associated with the development of character and the ability to lead uh, in combat and in civilian life. Character and leadership are the focus within which ethics is handled, and uh, that, uh, that's uh, important for all the services, and they take it very seriously. Let me move on then to what I'm really supposed to be talking about today, the dilemmas of nuclear strategy. I want to start by talking about the advent and early development of nuclear weapons and nuclear strategic thought. And the, uh, the presentation we just heard uh, provides a, a wonderful background for this because it talks about strategic thought uh, uh, in the, the period prior to nuclear weapons. To enter the world of reflection on nuclear strategy is for non-specialists to enter a world very different from the one they normally know today. For one thing, the bulk of such reflection was carried on in a time that's now well past. One may date the beginning of thinking about nuclear weapons and their use to the high-level meetings over the Manhattan Project, and more specifically to the debates over the use of two fission bombs, Little Boy and Fat Man, against Japan in 1945. That's now 70 years ago, though. In those debates, the ethical landscape was defined largely by two factors, that the Japanese surprise attack against Pearl Harbor had brought the U.S. into war with Japan, and that very large casualties were being sustained in the gradual conquest of Japanese-held areas of the Pacific. Ethical arguments thus tended to boil down to the wrongness of Japanese behavior and to utilitarian estimates of the relative numbers of casualties to be expected from a conventional military invasion of Japan uh, 
versus those to be expected from the use of the two nuclear bombs then available. In the immediate aftermath, what loomed as the most important uh, factor was that the nuclear bombings brought Japan to unconditional surrender and ended the war. The strategic context in 1945, though, was set by the practice of aerial bombardment as it had developed during World War II, and we have heard a good deal about this. Pre-war strategic thinkers had argued for what they call strategic air bombardment, aimed at the, civilian, the enemy's civilian population and infrastructure as a way to win a war in the shortest time. This stood in sharp contrast to tactical uses of air power, attacks against the enemy's fighting forces, lines of supply and communications, and war production centers. From the German blitz against England to the Allied counter city bombing campaign of Germany to the bombing of Japanese cities toward the end of the war, the strategic model became well established. An Allied bombing run during the last months of the war might easily drop a kiloton, that is a thousand tons, of TNT on the targeted area. As the first nuclear weapons were developed, it was a short and obvious step to rate their explosive capabilities by the standard of TNT bombs. By this standard, Little Boy at around 15 kilotons of TNT and Fat Man at around 20 kilotons were not excessively harmful. They weren't off the scale because the, the one kiloton uh, bombing raid would have to be repeated in, as soon as you were able to get enough planes up in the air again and then maybe again after that. So, you know, a, a kiloton here, a kiloton there, pretty soon you're up into big money. What was different about the nuclear weapons was that only one bomber, one time, not uh, uh, many flights over a period of days, was needed to deliver each of the new bombs. And their effect was centered, not spread out over a huge area, as would be the case with a conventional bombing raid. And this also indicated that you had to have a certain kind of a target for these things to be useful. This way of thinking, then, about nuclear weapons persisted in later debates over nuclear weapons and strategy, though attention gradually also began to be given to the radiological effects of these weapons, which was utterly ignored in the beginning. When the Soviet Union first began to develop nuclear weapons of its own, the strategic debate grew in this country to encompass the question of how to deter their use in an attack against the United States or Western Europe by the Soviet Union. This led to a serious and sustained debate over nuclear strategy in the U.S. and to some degree uh, in the U.K. and continental Europe from the late 1950s till about 1970 when American involvement in the Vietnam War shifted the focus of policy debate and planning in the U.S. In the early 1980s, the nuclear debate revived sharply in connection with the Reagan administration's nuclear buildup to close the perceived missile gap between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and the announcement of the plan to develop a strategic missile defense system, Star Wars, to its opponents. Both these stages of debate, the earlier one and the later one, involve military and civilian officials who developed theories and plans that were then and have remained largely classified, but there was also a spirited intellectual debate that took place in full view through articles and books from well-known publishers. This is my focus here. In many respects, it was the thought of these civilian nuclear strategists, as they've been called, academic intellectuals who wrote articles and books on specific aspects of nuclear policy and argued powerfully for specific kinds of nuclear strategy, which drove thinking both inside and outside the government. The most prominent among these civilian strategists included Oscar Morgenstern, Herman Kahn, Thomas Schelling, Thomas Murray, Albert Walshetter, and Philip Green. The principals among those who joined this debate from the frame of ethics were John C. Bennett, Reinhold Niebuhr's successor at Union Theological Seminary in New York, and more importantly, Paul Ramsey of Princeton in two books published in the 1960s. All these persons, the secular ones and the religious ethics people, were well known and respected in academic and public policy debates during this era, though today their names would be recognized by only a comparative few. 
Their work, though, remains important and accessible to anyone interested in what they had to say at the time, and it continues to remain relevant. So let me move to uh, some technical reflections, which uh, in some ways simply uh, uh, reiterates, but definitely uh, tries to build on what was said in the previous talk. I want to say a bit more about some of the major technical issues involving nuclear weapons and their use at that time. One was the inherent inaccuracy of aiming and delivery systems up through the end of this early period of debate. A major reason for the development of counter-city bombing during World War II was that it was impossible in practice for airplanes reliably to hit targets smaller than several city blocks in size with their bombs. This was true of both the German and the British Air Forces when the Norden bomb site came along uh, in the uh, U.S. bombers and, 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 and was given over to the Brits to use as well. Uh, this was, in principle, significantly more accurate. But as uh, we heard just a few minutes ago, uh, in, under the conditions of combat, uh, what starts out as a 23-meter CEP, or, or radius of, of uh, destruction, uh, becomes a radius of targeting, becomes a, uh, a, a kilometer uh, CEP. Uh, so it falls somewhere within a, a radius of a kilometer. And what this means is that if you're aiming at a particular target, uh, you can't just throw one bomb at it. Uh, you have to throw many, many, many uh, in order that you have a greater chance of hitting the target that you're actually aiming at. And uh, that necessarily produces a lot more destruction than if you only had that one bomb you were able to put on that 23-meter uh, circle. And furthermore, individual bombs or even a plane's whole load might go astray. Uh, the problem of the inaccuracy of the available delivery systems, especially under the conditions of the war, of war, was a major factor then in the choice of the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as targets for the first two atomic bombs. They were big enough so that if you were a little bit off-center, it really wouldn't matter. The possibilities for aerial bombing hadn't much changed by the period of the nuclear strategic debate of the 1950s and 60s. Missile technology was also in its infancy or early childhood, and ICBMs developed to carry nuclear warheads could not be finely focused as to where they would land. The measure adapt adapted for the size and number of nuclear warheads or bombs that would be needed to destroy a given target was the one I've already mentioned, the CEP, or Circular Error Probable, an older artillery term that referred to the radius of the circle within which 50% of the warheads fired at a given target could be expected to fall on average. Since blast effect falls off according to the square of the distance between the explosion and the target aimed at, there was significant pressure to provide redundancy when aiming to destroy a particular target and also to throw heavier yield warheads at it uh, so as to try to knock whatever you're aiming out. To put this all in less abstract terms, at the beginning of the Vietnam War, the 500-pound bombs used by American aircraft had uh, essentially a 750-foot CEP in practice. Later in the war, it was brought down to about half that. A 500-pound bomb can reduce a house to rubble if it hits it, but if it lands uh, 750 feet away, the house might only sustain minor damage. But what about the house that it hits 750 meters away? That's a different, different issue. And I, I have more to say on this, but I won't uh, uh, go uh, further into it. Uh, the, um, the JDAM, the Joint Direct Attack Munition, used in the bombardment of the Taliban at the start of the Afghan war had a CEP of about 40 feet. Every reduction of CEP, that is, every advance in targeting technology, means one or both of two things. First, the number of warheads needed to destroy a given target can be reduced, or secondly, the size, or, or, the, or in that same way, the size of individual warheads can be reduced, including replacing nuclear warheads in strategic bombardment by conventional ones. Uh, 
well, I, I, I lost the, the track here, but that, that's what I wanted to say. Um, all this is an element in what's called the Revolution in Military Affairs, or RMA. The kinds of accuracy and dependability now possible were unavailable and unthinkable, though, when the great debate among the civilian strategists was taking place. So let's move to that debate. Now to the parameters of that debate. In 1954, the Eisenhower administration adopted a nuclear strategy of massive retaliation, a policy advanced by Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. Fundamentally, it had the form of a declared policy that in the event of an enemy attack of whatever type or magnitude, the U.S. would respond with massive force, including nuclear weapons. While any and all attacks by potential enemies were covered by this policy, the focal target was the Soviet Union and its allies in the Warsaw Pact. Their conventional forces greatly outnumbered those of the NATO alliance, and so the announcement of the massive retaliation policy was meant as a warning to the Soviet Union that any conventional attack against NATO by the Warsaw Pact would be met by a nuclear response, which would include not only battlefield nuclear weapons then deployed and then development, but also nuclear strikes against the Soviet homeland and those of the Warsaw Pact allies. This policy remained the declared position of the U.S. until 1962, when in the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Kennedy administration announced a new policy of flexible response in which nuclear weapons might or might not be used. During the era of massive retaliation, a strategic nuclear strike effectively meant a counter-city or counter-population strike. This was so because of two factors, the, ab the ability then of available delivery systems and the fact that high-value government and military targets tended to be located in or close to major population centers. The Foreign Policy Research Institute is, what, about a mile from the Philadelphia Navy Yard? There you go. So you're aiming at the Navy Yard, you take out FPRI. Two for the price of one, no. <laughs> little, little dark humor there. Um, even if the declared aim of a particular strike were, for example, to destroy the Kremlin, given the available technology, such a strike would also destroy the city of Moscow. Massive retaliation meant effectively a commitment to a counterpopulation nuclear war since any such destruction of Soviet cities would have certainly been responded to by a Soviet nuclear missile strike aimed at American cities of high value. The fundamental reality was dissected and analyzed by games theorists attempting to devise ways to limit the numbers of cities destroyed and the numbers of people killed. Questions that were asked would be like, would destru destruction of Moscow be enough to end the conflict? Or would the Soviets respond by upping the scale, destroying Warsaw, Washington, New York, and Chicago? What next? What should the U.S. do? And so forth. However effective massive retaliation might have been, or might not have been, as a deterrence policy, and that was clearly what it aimed to be, it was extremely dangerous as a warfighting policy. The first major work of a civilian strategist to appear in the context of massive retaliation policy was Oscar Morgan Stern's The Question of National Defense, which appeared in 1959. Morgan Stern pro uh, promoted the importance of the most invulnerable nuclear retaliatory force then available, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, L SLBMs. His argument was that the Soviets would be deterred in any use of nuclear weapons against the U.S., by the knowledge that an entirely unreachable strike force could be unleashed in retaliation and could utterly destroy the Soviet Union and its allies. Morgan Stern assumed these missiles would be targeted against cities. To him, this increased their deterrent ability, but it also reflected the fact that the early SLBMs were less accurate than land-based missiles, and thus they needed targets as big as cities. The following year, two other civilian strategists joined the debate. Herman Kahn, in his On Thermonuclear War from 1960, took a much broader field of view than had Morgan Stern, 
paying close attention to the psychology of national leaders faced with decisions about using nuclear weapons, how to use them, and possibly not to use them at all. His arguments provided a devastating critique of massive retaliation as a war-fighting policy, citing concerns such as what I've mentioned, but it also gave new attention to the importance of using nuclear weapons not against cities, but against the USSR's own nuclear weapons and its conventional forces. Kahn took, also took aim at Morgan Stern's argument for an expanded SLBM deterrent and second strike force, opening up a new line of thinking about nuclear defense that didn't rely exclusively on deterrence. Arguing that it was already possible to destroy an enemy object, including a missile, if a location could be accurately known, Kahn advocated prioritizing efforts to develop new kinds of sensors that could provide such knowledge. Rejecting the then current argument that the offense had the edge in nuclear war, which uh, an argument which in its most extreme form became advocacy of a devastating first strike against the USSR, Against this, Kahn wrote that, in fact, defense has the edge, and it is, uh, in his words, as likely as not to be increased by further developments, end quote. This is the kind of thinking that led two, days, two decades later to the SDI, Star Wars, under Ronald Reagan. The second important contribution to this uh, civilian nuclear strategist debate that appeared in 1960 was Thomas Murray's Nuclear Policy for War and Peace. A major theme of this book was advocacy of counter-forces nuclear targeting over counter-population or counter-city targeting. This had also been a theme in Kahn's thinking, but Murray gave it his particular focus. By the time he wrote, the U.S. had a substantial force of land-based missiles and a nascent SLBM force, as well as the bombers of the Strategic Air Command all armed with thermonuclear warheads, that is, hydrogen bombs with megaton yields, multi-megaton yields, not simply atomic bombs with kiloton yields. There was redundancy here, huge amount of that, as well as a kill capacity much greater than had been possible for fission nuclear warheads, A-bombs. These factors combined to make a shift to counter forces targeting empirically possible. This would be more moral as the non-combatant population would not be directly and intentionally, intentionally targeted. But it would also, Murray argued, be more effective <clears throat> both as a deterrent and as a warfighting strategy since the Soviet Union could anticipate that if United States launched a nuclear strike, its military, including nuclear capabilities, would largely be annihilated and uh, people in the U.S. military who had read their class of it would have uh, bells going off in their head at this. Critics argued that a shift to a counter-forces strategy <clears throat> would increase the Soviet incentive to strike first. Against this, though, was the invulnerability of the SLBM leg of the nuclear delivery triad. It's at this point that the two ethicists I mentioned earlier can be brought into the picture. Both of them, uh, Bennett and Ramsey, were Christian ethicists. Secular philosophical ethics hadn't yet come on the scene in any important way. Bennett deserves mention uh, mainly as providing a window on the internal debate in American Protestantism between pacifism and the Christian realism of Bennett's predecessor and mentor at Union Theological Sem Seminary, Reinhold Niebuhr. There's a name you should recognize. Pacifism had become increasingly widespread in liberal Protestant denominations in the U.S. And this then was the mainstream establishment. And it translated into opposition to nuclear weapons, as for example in the position regularly reiterated by the National Council of Churches. But Niebuhr had offered an alternative. Whereas the pacifists held that war is always evil and so should be avoided by Christians, Niebuhr had held that while war is always evil, Sometimes it is a necessary evil, which Christians must grasp in order to oppose a worse evil. This was the basic position he took against the Nazis. Bennett basically followed in his steps. 
Thus, his position on nuclear weapons was that despite their evident evils, he could accept nuclear deterrence strategy that included the possibility of nuclear war as necessary to prevent possible conquest of the West by the forces of communism, which he regarded as the enemy of Christianity. The problem with Niebuhr's and Bennett's position was that it didn't really have anything to say about possible moral parameters for nuclear strategy. The debate between counterpopulation and counterforce strategies was in another dimension from the necessary evil rationale. So Ramsey comes on the scene, taking a very different tack. His entry into the de uh, debate of the civilian nuclear strategists was more por forceful and powerful as a result. His new tack, which he took explicitly in opposition to the position of the Christian pacifists and in criticism of Niebuhr, was to seek and recover and use, seek to recover and use the idea of just war, which by the time he wrote had disappeared from Christian theological reflection for about 350 years, that is the early 17th century. It was still there, incidentally, for those that want to think of this as in Catholic terms, it was still there in the Catholic canon law until 1918, but nobody paid much attention to it. Uh, and, uh, and the development of, of a 20th century Catholic canon law had gone in a very different direction. Uh, but uh, but it, it, it had really not been a subject that the theologians paid any attention to. They were more interested in developing various forms of pacifism than in working out the implications of the just war idea. Ramsey didn't actually recover the historical idea of just war, though. Rather, he invented a new conception of just war based on prominent theological themes in mid-20th century Christian ethic, ethical debate. Specifically, he constructed an understanding of just war around the Christian ethical norm of love of neighbor, which was very, very hot in the 1960s. Tracing this ultimately to Jesus' love command, Ramsey leaned heavily on Augustine, often cited as the first Christian just war theorist, arguing that Augustine's understanding of just war derived from his theology of caritas, or charity, the kind of love made possible by grace and given to all Christians not only as a gift but imposing an obligation on them. Charity towards the neighbor, Ramsey argued, means the Christian should oppose any unjust effort to harm an innocent neighbor. At the same time, charity sets limits on what can be done to the wrongdoer because he too is a neighbor the Christian is commanded to love. The idea of, Ram of just war, Ramsey argued, flows out of these dual implications of neighbor love, permission to use armed force if necessary to protect the neighbor being unjustly threatened or harmed, and second, limitation of the force in response because of the obligation to do no more than needed to protect the innocent. He argued that this basic idea or pair of ideas defines right conduct in warfare in terms of two principles, discrimination and proportionality. Discrimination or noncombatant immunity means that it is never right to directly intentionally target noncombatants. He tempered this only by consideration of the rule of double effect, which he drew from Thomas Aquinas, which fundamentally boils down to that when the object and intent of one's action is morally justified, one is not morally guilty for harm that is secondary and not directly intended. Proportionality comes into the moral picture only after discrimination is satisfied. Given that an act is moral, one should seek to limit its destructiveness so that the minimum harm is done while declaring the, or while accomplishing the uh, desired end. In two books from the 1960s, War and the Christian Conscience from 61 and The Just War from 68, Ramsey moved from this understanding of just war to engage the major civilian nuclear strategists in debate. He took special aim at the immorality of counter-city or counter-population warfare, arguing that it was a direct violation of the principle of discrimination and thus immoral whether as deterrence or warfighting strategy. This put him immediately in the camp of counter-force advocates like Murray, though he also commented positively on Kahn's advocacy 
of a strong defense system. His position also placed him in the line of those strategists who were arguing for more accurate delivery systems, though he never really followed this out. In a chapter of his 1968 book, first published in an article in 65, he took special notion, notice of a 1962 speech of then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, which announced the policy that, quote, the principal military objectives in the event of a nuclear war stemming from an attack on the alliance should be the destruction of the enemy's forces, not his civilian population, end quote. This was an explicit official statement of the shift in U.S. policy from counterpopulation to counterforces targeting as the basis for nuclear deterrence strategy and, if necessary, fighting a nuclear war. The new policy announced by McNamara didn't explicitly rule out counterpopulation attacks, and the civilian strategic debate after his announcement explored various kinds of mix between counterforce and countercity targeting as possible within the frame of the declared policy. Ramsey's own position didn't rule out that significant numbers of noncombatant casualties could still occur as a result of counterforce strikes. This was allowed by the rule of double effect. But here's where the principle of proportionality came into his argument. Counterforce targeting satisfied the requirements of the principle of discrimination, he argued, since it meant that noncombatants were not being directly intentionally targeted. <clears throat> but it also meant that proportionately lower noncombatant casualties would also result as collateral harm from the counterforce strikes. As Ramsey put it, commenting on the policy realignment, there is a real difference between 215 million people dead as a result of an all-out counter-city war and 25 million dead as a result of all-out counter-force war. So the principle of proportionality, as he understood it, was satisfied as well, though his main focus was on the principle of discrimination, which he regarded as an exceptionalist moral rule rooted in the Ob the obligation of love of neighbor. <clears throat> in the end, Ramsey refined his position, taking account of options examined in the civilian strategist debate to embrace a strategy of counterforce plus avoidance. Counterforces targeting plus avoidance of civilian damage as much as possible, even while accepting this as an unavoidable indirect effect. Michael Walzer, nine years later, in his Just and Unjust Wars in 1977, without mentioning Ramsey, re also refined the rule of double effect in this direction, to require efforts to reduce indirect and unintended harm to noncombatants from a legitimate attack on a combatant target. Walzer developed a second new version of the Just War idea, Ramsey was first, that has since become widely influential, especially among philosophers. But writing in the context of the Vietnam War, after the earlier nuclear debate had died down, he provided only a brief discussion of nuclear weapons and deterrence and uh, didn't really add to the earlier debate. Ramsey and the other civilian strategists that he engaged in debate recognized that a nuclear deterrence strategy was inseparable from a nuclear warfighting strategy. So his point in exploring the moral outer limits for a possible nuclear war was not to argue for use of nuclear weapons in war, but rather to define a deterrent strategy that could succeed, since it was backed up by an enforcement plan that the adversary could realistically expect to be implemented. But in the Christian moral community out of which Ramsey came, there remained a strong element of anti-nuclearism, and critics working from this perspective rejected his use of double effect reasoning while using his insistence on discrimination to argue against him, that in a nuclear war, discrimination is impossible to achieve, and therefore any use of nuclear weapons is immoral. Now this was the position taken in the focal document of the second phase of ethical debate over nuclear weapons, the U.S. National Conference of Catholic Bishops 1983 pastoral letter, The Challenge of Peace. The historical context of this pastoral letter was the U.S. nuclear buildup undertaken by the Reagan administration in response to the missile gap. 
this concern, uh, the, the Reagan administration's concern, provided the strategic rationale also for the development of the Strategic Defense Initiative. But the Catholic anti-war movement centered on a group that took the name Pax Christi and regarded all this as a, a buildup to nuclear war. The Pax Christi movement included laity, members of religious orders and clergy, and most importantly, it included a number of fairly influential bishops. The, the, within the Conference of Bishops, those bishops associated with this movement pressed hard for the Conference of Bishops to take a stand against nuclear weapons and nuclear war. And this led ultimately to the, uh, the, the uh, pastoral letter. <clears throat> the second draft of this letter, which had an ex explicitly pacifist uh, side to it, put the work of the bishops squarely in the light of public debate as both the New York Times and the Washington Post published the draft in full with accompanying front page articles. The debate over nuclear weapons and deterrence, which had shaped, sharply waned at the beginning of the Vietnam War, suddenly revived with vigor. The second draft was rejected by the bishops, and a third draft was produced that, finally, that became essentially the final version. But this third draft uh, provided us with yet a third reinvention of the idea of just war. This time, it was phrased in a way that built on the pacifist idea that all uh, Christian thinking about war begins with a presumption against war, and the idea of just war uh, existed, according to the bishops, only to overturn this in limited, specific cases. Uh, the bishops have never found any such case to exist, incidentally, since then. So my, my view is that the pacifists won that round. <clears throat> as, nuclear, as, uh, as to nuclear weapons and deterrence specifically, the Catholic bishops argued that nuclear weapons could never be morally used under any circumstances and in any way. They rejected outright any war fighting plans or, or preparations. This meant they placed themselves on record also against efforts then underway to downsize the warheads in the strategic force and to make the delivery systems more accurate. They regarded these as war fighting moves. The goal, the bishops argued, should be complete nuclear disarmament. But in the meantime, they were ready to grant that a stockpile of nuclear weapons could be retained for deterrence purposes, though they could not be retained in war fighting configurations. So we have to pull them up out of the missile uh, silos and take them off of the B-52s and take them out of the SLBMs and put them away in warehouses. The argument of the challenge of peace thus decisively separated the matter of nuclear deterrence from the possibility of any form of use of nuclear weapons. And critics lost no time in pointing out that this made for a worthless deterrence. Supporters of the bishops responded that this wasn't so, deterrence was still provided by the uncertainty surrounding the possible use of the stockpiled nuclear weapons. But this seemed a thin argument, since the bishops were so clearly opposed to any use of nuclear weapons by the US. There was a good deal of debate in conferences held during the preparation of the challenge of peace and after its publication, but the level and volume of this debate never compared to that of the civilian strategists in the late 50s through 60s. Secular thinkers generally avoided debate against the Catholic bishops. The National Council of Churches reaffirmed its own nuclear pacifist position, and various Protestant denominations, not to be outdone by the Catholics, issued their own official statements in the early 80s. The most substantial of these Protestant statements was the pastoral letter of the United Methodist bishops in defense of creation, published in 1986. It, too, opposed any use of nuclear weapons as part of a broader stance against the morality of war, arguing instead for the settlement of all disputes by negotiation and for a Christian ethic moving, quote, beyond just war theory, end quote, to a commitment to, quote, positive peacemaking, uh, end quote. Paul Ramsey, himself a Methodist, in his last book, Speak Up for Just War or Pacifism, which appeared in 1988, shortly before he died, uh, Ramsey subjected this document and that from the Catholic bishops to a scathing critique 
in which he returned to the main themes of his moral analysis of just war and the question of nuclear weapons he had developed uh, in the 1960s. <clears throat> now this book uh, from Rams of Ramsey's from 68 was the last by a major thinker on the ethical dimensions of nuclear weapons deterrence and the possible the conduct of, of a possible nuclear war. Today, of course, the context is different. With the fall of the Soviet Union only shortly after this last book of Ramsey's appeared, the terms of international relations changed and the possibility of a superpower nuclear exchange with deterrent strategy aimed at preventing such a war sharply diminished. Progress was made in bilateral nuclear disarmament arranged cooperatively by the former Cold War adversaries. But at the same time, other states were acquiring nuclear weapons or were uh, actively trying to do so. And it was not at all clear that some of these, bearing enmity towards the U.S. and the West, could be affected by the, deter the deterrent strategies that had been reciprocally developed by the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Deterrence theory depends heavily on a rational actor theory of political decision making. And it's not at all clear that ideologically driven states like North Korea and perhaps Iran, or non-state groups like Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, fit this model. The proliferation of radical Islamist terrorism has also raised the possibility of terrorists stealing a poorly protected nuclear device, acquiring enough fissionable material to make their own device or, use, or devising a radiologically dirty bomb that, though without creating the blast damage of a nuclear weapon, could cause widespread casualties and disruption of life by its use. None of these possibilities is really subject to deterrence. <clears throat> they have to be headed off by other means, and those means are already being used in the broader struggle against terrorism. For these reasons, there's no contemporary ethical or policy debate over nuclear weapon strategy anywhere near comparable to that of the years 1955 to 1970. That earlier debate remains important, though, because it so thoroughly and with such nuance explored the problems posed by nuclear weapons and how to cope with them, including the moral dimensions of how to cope with them. The vocabulary, the concepts, the moral parameters, the policy options, and much else developed there defined a frame for thinking about nuclear weapons that has not since been surpassed. For this reason, it deserves our continued attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll open it up for questions. We'll begin with uh, Paul Dickler. With regard to uh, the use of nuclear weapons in World War II, um, one of the arguments that often was made is that even though Japan was going to surrender, certainly several hundred, if not several thousand, Americans would die in the interim, you know, without the nuclear weapons having been used. And Truman often made the argument, I couldn't look even one mother in the face and say, well, your son died when he didn't have to had I used that weapon. So to you, does this boil down to simply the ethical question of numbers? You know, how many of the enemy combatant versus how many of your own soldiers? Yeah, I, I think it did. But I, I think that from the perspective of, of the, the head of state, who ultimately is the one responsible for those lives, uh, it's, it's more than that. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think there is, uh, this, this is the, uh, the, 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 the curse, really, of being the one in charge, the one at whom the buck stops. Uh, but certainly, uh, a lot of the debate was effectively a debate about proportionality. If you read Paul Fussell's book on this, uh, Fussell's best known for his book, The Great War in Modern Memory, but he also wrote a book uh, that reflected heavily on his own involvement as an enlisted man in, in World War II. And uh, uh, as, uh, as one of the uh, invasion force already on board ship heading for Japan at the time the bombs were dropped, uh, he felt very strongly that this was the right thing uh, because he, uh, he uh, tended to place the, the numbers of casualties 
uh, in the higher levels. Uh, and there were casualties not only for the, for the U.S. forces, but also for the Japanese forces. I think Eisenhower had put them at a maximum of 86,000. Yeah, I well, I don't remember what Paul Fussell put them at, but he, he put them very high. So, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, my, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, during this period, moral debate, frankly, was at a low ebb. Uh, the, uh, the, the way that uh, moral debate was being carried on in this country was largely in terms of Niebuhr's version of political realism. And uh, that, as I suggested, doesn't get you very far. Uh, Randy Lan Lanny? Yes, sir. When you were describing the evolution of nuclear strategy, you started off by talking about massive retaliation, uh, President Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles, and then you moved on to flexible response with Kennedy. And it's kind of my thought that as time has moved on, the description or characteristics of our nuclear threat uh, strategy seems to get vaguer and vaguer and vaguer. And for example, you, you hear things like realistic deterrence or strategic sufficiency. And my question for you is, sir, if you had to describe or characterize our nuclear strategy in 2015, how, how would you do that? I wouldn't even begin. Uh, I, I'm just not sure I know. Um, Whatever it is, is uh, has to be viewed through the uh, uh, the various national strategy and, and operation strategy papers, and uh, they have not specifically talked about nuclear weapons. So, uh, uh, but I, I would say that I uh, my my own sense of it, my own judgment about it, is that uh, there has been a good deal of backing away from uh, the threshold. Uh, backing away vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the threshold would be for use of nukes. And the reason for this is that uh, uh, we now have conventional weapons that can do a lot of the things that could only be done by nukes in earlier days. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the possibility of, uh, of, of putting a, a, a heavy TNT bomb or, or a grouping of them on a, uh, a target very close to it uh, is a massive move in the direction that allows you to back away from the use of nukes. Uh, if, you're, if you're talking about trying to destroy a, uh, a target uh, that, that may be a hardened target, uh, somewhere within a, a thousand meter uh, radius of a circle, uh, then you know, think of, you're, you're gonna think of, of using the biggest weapon you can possibly get to go at it, and you know you're going to have to use multiple ones because you can't depend on one of them uh, actually even being in the circle. Uh, and uh, so uh, as we became able to uh, actually hit targets that we were aiming at, uh, the game changed. Uh, so that's, that's just my own view. I, I don't know uh, what, the, what the folks on the inside behind the dark screens are are thinking about this, but uh, but it seems to me that the threshold has has changed considerably. So that, for example, if if there were to be a, a preemptive strike uh, against Iran at some point, and this has been discussed certainly in plain view, uh, it wouldn't have to be by nukes. Uh, Melanie Boulay, New Orleans High School. Uh, Professor Dunson, I yes. was wondering if you feel like the whole debate over just war as it applies to nuclear arms was more driven by the uh, quantity of people uh, who's, uh, who died due to their nuclear arms or by the way that they died. Um, and do you think, in other words, do you think that nuclear arms are more unethical because of the way that people die or because of, uh, than, than conventional arms? Thank you. Well, one thing that, that I, I don't think we today really appreciate is how, how little attention was paid to the radiation effects of nukes in the early years. Uh, they, were, they were evaluated in terms of their blast effect, their, their megatonnage or their kilotonnage. Uh, and, uh, and there were even uh, significant voices arguing that, uh, you know, radiation's not a big deal. It may even be beneficial. Uh, uh, those of you who are Spider-Man fans uh, and read the early comics, as I did, 
will remember that uh, Spider-Man got his magical powers by being irradiated. Now, you know, if, if that's what you're thinking, you're just not worried about this stuff. We know better now. And, uh, and, and so the, the, the nature of the uh, debate would necessarily shift on that. And I think has shifted. I, I think this is why, why there is uh, uh, much less, uh, I don't know, sort of sang froid uh, about the possibility of a nuclear war. Gary Morris. Um, excellent discussion on nuclear strategy and the, and the co com combination with just war. However, my question is this. In a world where we have countries exploring the development of nuclear weapons um, or, or going much beyond that, can we depend on other countries to go through the same ethical and moral discussions as the United States did in the process of this idea? Well, thank you for asking a question. I'd, I'd feel really left out if you skipped me. Uh, <laughs> um, every, every society makes its political decisions its own way. And in some of them, the, uh, the attitudes of the broader populace are more important, and than others, they're lesser, of lesser importance. So I, I think that, that the answer to that has to do with, with every specific case. You know, you, you have to look at every, every case and think about how it would be made. Uh, I, I have never, for example, been uh, entirely uh, happy with the, uh, the assumption that if Iran develops a bomb, uh, that first thing it's going to do is knock out Jerusalem. Because after all, it's Jerusalem, you know. And even if you, if you uh, target on Tel Aviv, uh, Jerusalem is going to be seriously harmed. Uh, and, uh, and also there is the uh, strict Quranic prohibition against using fire as a weapon of war because fire is the, is the weapon that Allah will use in the, in the last days to purify the earth. This is one of the, one of the uh, reasons for the very, very strong uh, backlash against uh, Daesh Islamic State for burning the Jordanian pilot. Uh, so, uh, so the question is then, well, you know, what, uh, how, do, how do we evaluate uh, what, uh, what Iran is, uh, is trying to do? And I, I suggest that uh, an important element of doing that has to be trying to get inside the, the, uh, the mindset, uh, which includes the, <clears throat> the religious elements of that mindset, uh, and, uh, and, and reasoning outward from there. But every, it would be different for every society. I, I, I wouldn't even begin to guess what, uh, how, to, how to answer that with respect to North Korea. Amit Prakash. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my question actually goes back to the first question that was asked, which was about the moral calculation on actually using nuclear weapons in Japan and it being a question of numbers. And I was just wondering, Yes, there is this sort of quantitative argument, but isn't it qualitative as well? Because we're talking about the enemy, but also civilians, right? So that there's soldiers who might become casualties, but to preclude that, civilians would have to die. Um, and I was wondering, you know, I, if I would reverse that, I, I would say if an enemy was attacking the United States and to obviate incurring their own casualties, they decided to attack American civilians, I would consider that a bit cowardly. Um, so I was just wondering, does that sort of transform the debate about morality in, in this? It's not just a question of numbers, but of numbers of a certain type. Well, in the context of World War II, uh, and again, I refer back to the previous talk, in the context of World War II, that bridge had already been crossed practically. Uh, so that even though uh, people might, uh, pilot, the pilot and crew getting off a, a B-52 after coming back from a raid against Japan might, uh, might, might be morally troubled by the fact that, that uh, large numbers of civilians had died as a result of their raid. Uh, 
But on the other hand, I said it'd be 52. I didn't mean that, obviously. B29. Uh, but but um, but the the uh, the practical matter uh, was that by by the end of uh, of the Second World War, uh, the the nature of strategic bombing had had uh, become such that that this was routine, and uh, and and it wasn't clear how to get away from that. Uh, but a further issue is that that I don't think that the matters were really uh, the the moral debate had really been. Uh, sharply focused on this by this time. If you think about, uh, it, it would be useful, I think, for everybody to go back and look at what the law of war was at the, uh, during, during the, uh, the conduct of the Second World War. That was defined by uh, the, the, the Hague uh, conferences and by the uh, Geneva Conventions of 1929, basically. And, uh, and, and there were a lot of, of uh, gaps there. Uh, relating to the uh, conduct of war. Furthermore, the, the, uh, the older doctrine that if one side does something to you, you can do the same thing to them, reciprocity, was still very much in force. And, uh, and so the, uh, the war tended to escalate in, in ever more unconstrained ways, it seems to me. Now, this was the legacy then that, that went into the earlier debates over nuclear weapons. Uh, the uh, uh, I, I think that the uh, the arguments over um, over counter city versus counter population or counter city or population targeting versus counter force targeting uh, needed to be there from the very first, but they weren't. Uh, it just didn't occur to the people that were talking about this stuff to uh, to worry about killing enemy civilians if you were really aiming at an em enemy uh, 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 political installation or military installation or whatever. This, this wasn't uh, foremost in their, in their thinking. Uh, so it took a while for this to, uh, to, to become a focal uh, issue and for the kind of distinction that you get in the counter forces versus counter uh, population uh, debate and the kind you get in, in Ramsey's focus on the idea of discrimination. Uh, you know, this this is uh, this is something that uh, takes a while to develop. Thank you. Okay. Join me in thanking Professor Johnson.